Welcome back my little subscribers. Today, we're gonna go over a simple setup to do macro photography from your home without anything fancy. Let's do this. So, photography is fun and it's always an adventure because you can do so much with the same tools you have. So in this video, we're gonna talk about what you need to do macro photography. And that's, I'm just gonna go down the list and I'm gonna show you how I do it. And it, again, it's not pro, it's not expert level, but with enough practice, you can get the shots that you wanna get uh, to stand out a little bit more or just to change up the style that you do. So first things first, you need a camera. That's pretty obvious, huh? So what is the right camera? Well, it depends on your budget, but you preferably want a camera that allows you to switch lenses. And that leads up to the next one. You, you're gonna be talking about an interchangeable lens camera. That could be micro four thirds, it could be a APS-C, full frame, you name it. Any of those work. You just need to be able to have the option of putting different lenses on it and a good alternative is if you have a bridge camera and it has a zoom function and it may even have a macro function so you can go ahead and use that if you don't have a macro lens or the budget to spend on one right now it doesn't matter just get the best lens you have that is within the 50 millimeter and onward telephoto range and you're already off to a great start and i'll explain why if you have a macro lens your job is pretty straightforward your airy has the ability to close up on the small details of that object you're gonna photograph. It could be a watch, jewelry, a product. It can be anything. It can be a candle. And so, let's say you don't have a macro lens. All you need to do is take the best shot possible with that detail that you're looking for and crop in later in post-production. And I'll do an example of that on this. Step two, you have your camera, you have your lens. The most important thing is your lighting. And so lighting, is going to make or break your shot. You want something to evenly light that product that you're photographing to highlight its features. In my case, recommending a minimalist setup, I can recommend you to use LED lights. And you can use any type of LED. It doesn't need to be necessarily a photo dedicated light. And so you can see here, I've got this one here. This is just a simple tabletop LED that I got on Amazon and I can dim it and I can make it at its brightest which I'm gonna do and it's going to more evenly it's gonna more evenly light the surface below it and that's gonna be my working space one LED I would recommend having something like that that's gonna evenly light your surface in my case I'm choosing the table so I've got this wooden um, wooden table it's going to be my surface for this shot and i have this light that's illuminating that table but you're going to need a light to illuminate the object because you want to make sure it's evenly lit and you'll see why in a bit i want to be sensitive to budget because we've all been there especially when we're trying uh, to get better at photography and we're learning we don't have the budget to buy a 300 dollars strobe or even a thousand because they're super expensive so i highly recommend you to find an led that goes on the table kind of like the one i showed you if you don't have one you can find it for like 20 or 30 dollars or you can use something you already have and work around it but if you're going to find a light to specifically highlight your object or your product you're going to want something like this and this is newer's response slash compet competitor to the Aperture ALMX. And as you'll tell, they look identical like this. It's a simple light, lithium powered internally, all the controls on the top, just how you need them. You can watch my video where I compare this one to the ALMX, buy this one, it's $50. The other one's like 150, so you can buy three of these basically. And it's actually bigger which means you're going to get more light power out of it. And I like this one because I can control the light temperature and the power of the light. And it's a very significant light. Um, I'll be able to put it pretty close to my product without it being in the shot. 
You've got your camera. You've got your lighting. You've got your surface. What are you going to photograph? Take a quick minute. Think about it. Is it your new Brenda sanitizer? You want to photograph it for your website? Is it a candle? Accessories? It can be anything you want. We're talking about objects that you want to highlight certain features. So you obviously want to pick something interesting. Ikea candle light holder with the candle not included. It sounds dumb, but most of the things we buy, we're, we're looking at product shots and they encourage us to buy them because they look good. For the sake of this example, I'm going to use something that I'm passionate about, and that is watches. It might be jewelry for you, or it might be something totally different like what I said. It could be a candle, it could be whatever you want. I'm picking watches because I like the details that come into highlighting the craftsmanship that goes into making one. So you have a lot to play with. So we're going to work with a watch that blends well with this tabletop, which is wood. So I'm picking something that's brown toned leather. Um, vintage -y look. That's what I'm going to go for. You have to decide what you want to do with your shot. But that's what I'm going to do in this example. Okay. So I'll do a quick introduction. We're going to be photographing a watch that is a small company. It's a Swiss made company. It's not a big company. It's been a law. It's been around for a long time. It's just never made it to that level of recognition as other brands are. But I chose it because it has my name. <laughs> And that's this watch. And that's this watch. And so I thought it was cool to have a watch with my name in it and that pays tribute to its tradition of watches that came out in the 1950s and 1960s. I love vintage watches and this was the best of both worlds being a modern movement an ETA 25 jewels in an old-fashioned design that if you look online you can find Omegas and other brands from the 50s and 60s using the same design which is really awesome and unique and the other cool part is it's automatic so there's a lot of cool things to like about it and as you'll see there's a lot of details that I want to make stand out on this and it will be helpful for you uh, to find what those details are for what you're photographing. So after having your equipment and your light, what's important are your settings. You're gonna wanna be in manual. That's the first thing. Definitely do not do anything else because the lighting is going to affect the computation in the camera and it's just not gonna give you the results you want in this controlled situation. Macro photography is different from other photography, like portraiture. In portraiture, you may or may not want to be eliminating the background. That's not the case in this. You want pictures to be sharp, crisp, and to show as much detail as possible. So, now that I'm in manual, I'm actually going to go around F9, between F9 and F13, depending on how close I'm gonna get to the object and how it's gonna look as I'm looking through it I'm gonna be able to determine where I'm gonna be at most likely I want to be in the middle I'd say a safe start is around f11 so let's go ahead and do f11 um, shutter speed you want to do the the shortest shutter speed that you can possibly do without getting camera shake if you're using a tripod then you don't have to worry about that you'll just put a two second timer and let it shoot at whatever that shutter speed is. But in my case, I'm teaching you the minimalist uh, running gun style macro shot. Probably not the best, but I mean, you can just get started and do it. I'm gonna use, this is a 90 millimeter, so I at least want to be at 90, 90th second, 1 90th of a second. So I'm actually gonna just round that up to 1 100th. And since this has image stabilization, I'm just gonna go ahead and go to 1 80th just to get as much light as possible. ISO. Your ISO is going to really depend on your camera that you're picking and the amount of lighting you're going to be able to supply. So since we're shooting at f11, we're going to need a lot of light because we're in an indoor situation and it's controlled. In this particular scenario, 
I've got the watch here. This is gonna be my workspace. Let me move this so you can see what I'm doing. This is my work area. It's all gonna be gone. And like, none of this is gonna be visible. This, the center of the attention is the watch. So, I'm gonna put it right here. I think this is gonna be the best orientation for the space I have. And with this amount of light, I'm gonna lower it. And what I'm gonna do is gonna go on my camera with having put F11 and 1 80th of a second, I'm gonna go ahead and focus on it just to see how much light's going through. And right here, I actually have to move this. Don't forget to change your um, exposure conversation. Just put it at zero because you don't want the ISO. We're gonna set the ISO manually, but for testing how much light's coming through, just put it at zero. So from right here, my camera is being forced to go to six one six. Uh, sorry, ISO 1600. Is that bad? No, not necessarily. But if you're using a Micro Four Thirds camera, Micro Four Thirds camera, that's probably not where you want to be. However, we haven't brought in the additional light that's going to highlight this watch. And then one more thing I forgot to mention: you want to have one of these just to get the dust off. You're gonna notice a lot of dust when you're doing macro shots, and it can be either on the object or on your actual lens. Some of it you can take off during um, during post-production. All right, so we've got this light. We're gonna go ahead and turn it on. You see how much more light came through right now? It's blinding the camera. I'm gonna put it right here. And that's because the light's not even going to come out. So now I'm going to test this again. And I'm at 320 ISO, which is perfect. I want to keep it low. I don't want to push the ISO. If I had to, with a full frame, I'm comfortable going up to 3200, 6400 to get a clean shot of a macro. But of course, we have the lighting, so we don't need to do that. But let's say you're using an APS-C, which cuts down the light a bit. Push it maybe 1600, and you'll still be okay. So just make sure that you've got these two. Some people use strobes to get these type of shots, but continuous LED kind of lets you see exactly what you're getting in the moment, which is really cool. So this may look really weird, but once we take the shot, you're gonna see that this actually works. So I've got this right here. And depending on how much surface I want the light, I can also do this. This, okay, so we have the setup, we have the settings. I'm going to lock in my ISO at 320. So go ahead and lock in your ISO. I'm going to do 400. I'm just going to round it up. Overexpose just a little bit. Um, now think about the object like I told you. What is that object that you're photographing? What is it that you want to stand out? Here we're talking about a watch. So obviously there's a lot of elements that you want to highlight. One could be the leather. One could be the case shape. In this particular case, this vintage watch has a uh, convex glass on the top. This has a domed, this has a domed sapphire crystal. So that's a detail I want to highlight because it goes up. So I want to make sure I show that. The crown always has an engraving. So that's something I want to show off. The main watch itself, the face, the image of it is something you want to show off as a whole. Maybe the name, like I want to focus on that and the sign, the the hour mar markers might be something or the numbers, the numerals on there I want to show off. I don't know if I want to keep it moving. Why not? Just make it run a little bit. But you know what else? Sometimes these watches show you the movement. So I think I obviously want to show this detail. This brand Marvin likes to use the red on the leather and the red on the 40th minute. And I can barely see it. So I'm going to highlight the leather. But this is the star of the show. What makes the watch move, it's the movement. I want to highlight this, especially because it's been treated with gold plating and it looks really nice. So let's get started.
photographing a watch, just know uh, 10, 10 with 32 seconds is the preferable time that you want your watch to be on set so that you can highlight the, the logos and the names. All, all the features highlight better. Let's go to 10, 10. And since I know this is going to take a while with this watch, I'm going to go ahead and put 10, 07. That gives me a couple minutes um, to show off the most. And then I'm going to take the shot when the second ticker is at 32 seconds. That way I show it off just like the magazines. Isn't that cool? All right, let's do this. I've got my settings, F11. Noticing with a mirrorless, you can see how much is in focus. I'm actually going to bump it up to F13. 14. All right, here we go. 32. I'm using the silent shutter, by the way. Okay. I'm, I'm reviewing the shot. Always review your shot. I think uh, it's a good first shot. It shows the curve of the glass. I think I need to take it more straight. More down, up, down, straight. I, I was curving the, the perspective too much. Let's do that again. So let's wait till it gets to 32 seconds. Okay. Super clean. Move on. I just got it straight on. Now I want to highlight the crown to show off how thin it is. So I'm going to just wrap it a little bit. Put it like that. I'm going to highlight the crown that's engraved. So this one, it doesn't matter what time it is. I'm just going to take the shot. It looks like I need a little bit more lighting on the actual crown, so I'm gonna do this. So that's the cool thing about having an LED that moves. And it's neat, cause this has the rose gold PVD, and I just noticed there's a scratch. We can remove that later on post-processing. So let's take a picture of the buckle. I'm gonna be on this side now. There we go. Kind of blends with the table, I like it. Okay. Now, super cool feature from this watch is, I mean, they honor a lot of their vintage cues. And one of those is honoring their founder and from 1860s. Um, and by the way they honor their founder is by putting the engravings of the two brothers that founded this company. And their engraving is right here. It's super subtle. It's not meant to stand out at all. But in product photography, you want to look for those little details. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And at the same time, I'm gonna get this Marvin leather in red. It's gonna look nice. This is a perfect opportunity to highlight that. Here we go, I'm focusing on the engraving. It's really small, so actually the red leather might be the highlight here. You gotta try. Don't give up. You always wanna take a couple shots because you don't know if you got a blurry shot in there. Um, I kind of have to change my angle because the Marvin script isn't showing completely. There we go. That's perfect. That red's going to look nice on the computer once we're editing it. Alright, and finally, we're going to do the movement now. By turning it this way, I can see the balance moving back and forth, which is what's keeping it ticking. I can see the rotor, which is decorated and has a red crown on it, which is going to be an excellent touch to focus on, as well as the movement itself encased with the red leather. It just makes it stand out. So let's go ahead and capture that. 
Let's do a first, let's first do a full shot overall showing just everything. That just looks beautiful. The contrast in the colors, gold, red, steel, wood. It's a good combination. Okay. Now, I like that they engraved the rotor, so let's focus on that now. It looks awesome. This is going to look so good when it's complete. Now let's get that the spring. Oh, and it's nice. Since I'm shooting at a low shutter speed, it's actually capturing the movement of the spring, which is going to look neat. So the cool thing about this is that if you have a camera with at least 20 megapixels, these shots that I just took, I'll be able to zoom in and get even more fine detail on that movement. I just want to make sure I capture the movement. All right, I think that's the highlight for me on this watch. You can obviously take your time with it and get even more refined shots, better shots, and keep looking at those little details. I could have kept going and done uh, the numerals, the hour markers. There's a lot that you can do. There's a lot that you can do with any object that you have. Even though it sounds lame, let's say I photograph this sanitizer bottle. Sanitize your hands, guys. There's so many different ways of photographing this. It could be straight on, it can be above, it can be highlighting the brand, like a closer up. There's a lot of things, don't, don't limit yourself. The more you practice, the more you'll see. Uh, you just take time with that object and be like, what is standing out to me from this object that I wanna share? And that's how you decide which key shots you wanna take. And so, Let's go ahead and look at the final versions. Uh, I'm not going to show you how I edited them because it's just going to take a bit too long. I already went on for so long. Maybe we'll do another video where I show you how I edit these. But these are the final versions. I hope you enjoyed it. You can do macro photography from home with simple tools, simple lighting. You don't need a whole strobe studio setup to get amazing shots. I hope you enjoyed this video.